Jolly good. Um, thank you, Kate. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you, Toby, for, uh, for the invitation. And also to everyone for this morning, I think it was a very promising beginning, and I'm already lamenting the fact I can only be here for two days, and I really would have rather stayed for the whole thing, given how this conversation is, uh, is shaping up. Uh, my job, at least uh, right now, is to, or the next 45 minutes, is to, is to talk about um, uh, work and labor in, in the creative sector, um, but not just in the sector, to try and put it in the context of uh, new patterns of work in recomposition of labor and the ongoing division of labor, uh, to put it in that sort of wider context, which, uh, which I think is kind of important. I want to begin with a comment or an observation about, um, about Raymond Williams, whom, as most of you, I'm sure, know, conducted several painstaking analyses from the late 1950s onwards of how the term culture has been variously interpreted and defined, identified. And I think from the vantage point of our discussion here, it's noteworthy that Williams, in all of these surveys, barely dwelled on the topic of culture as a form of labor, or to put it another way, how do people make a living out of culture as a form of livelihood? Now, um, no doubt there are several reasons for this inattention, um, not least the tendency of the day to establish some distance from the prevailing tendency on the left that was called productivism at this time. Um, and and not, I'm not suggesting that Williams was inattentive to labor as such. I mean, as many of you know, he wrote very perceptively about his own laborist background and about the culture of working class people. Um, but apart from some commentary about uh, the artisanal associations that enabled the advocates of romanticism to, um, to elevate culture to a near sacred cause in the early 19th century. Apart from those observations, it's really hardly anything. Richard has very little to say about culture as a form of livelihood. Now, for the purposes of this presentation, let me attribute uh, Williams' disregard to the fact that the landscape of cultural work in the era of the Keynesian welfare state was a relatively settled environment and not especially eligible for the kind of uh, thorough reconceptualization that Williams liked to embark upon or set himself to undertake. At the time, those who made a secure living from culture belonged either to the stable commercial industries of broadcasting, recording, and publishing, or to the design and academic professions. By contrast, the non-commercial sector, uh, in part supported, large part supported by public subsidy, uh, was a vast domain of non-standard work, entirely marginal to the productive economy, but absolutely essential to the prestige of elites and, and the democratic lifeblood of the polity. The study of art worlds at the time was a steady subfield of the social scientists, and there were a number of economists who, who took an interest, who surveyed things like the productivity of artists. Um, they tended to puzzle over the gap between uh, the performance and income um, outputs of artists and those in service occupations, workers in service occupations that were more amenable to quantitative analysis. Um, the most well-known of these economists was William Baumel, who uh, in his work concluded uh, in one famous study of the performing arts that uh, the performing arts were subject to what he called a cost disease the cost disease, sometimes known as the Baumol effect or the Baumol disease, <laughs> uh, is something that condemns the cost per live performance to rise at a rate persistently faster than that of a typically manufactured good. <laughs> now, folks who are somehow disadvantaged by this cost disease um, um, in the arts, in his judgment, had two choices. They could either join the productive sector, uh, by emulating the commercial culture industries in adopting uh, productivity boosting technologies, or uh, they could conform to the model of social services like health or education, which produce a, a heavily subsidized public good um, and also fall under the heavy hand of uh, bureaucratic administration. 
Now, in the decades since Williams' inattention and Baumol's prognosis, the ground has shifted quite noticeably. And in ways, I think it's fair to say, neither of them could have been expected to predict. Cultural labor now finds itself in the cockpit of attention, front and center of the latest uh, rollouts of neoliberal programs, as paradigms of entrepreneurial selfhood, creatives, as they're often labeled, uh, are the apple of the policymaker's eye, they're recipients of the kind of lip service that's usually bestowed by national managers on high-tech engineers as generators of value and revenue. Art products are the, are, are the objects of intense financial speculation. Uh, cultural productions are top hit makers in the new jackpot economy. Cultural districts are posited as the key to urban prosperity. And, of course, creative industries policy is embraced as an anchor of regional development by governments around the world. In the business world, creativity is viewed as uh, some kind of wonder stuff for transforming workplaces into powerhouses of value. And last but not least, of course, intellectual property, the, the lucrative prize of creative endeavor, is increasingly regarded as the oil of the 21st century. Now, this paradigm shift, and I think it's fair to call it that, this paradigm shift from the, you know, from the margins to the center has been well documented in accounts of the emergence of uh, creative industries policy making, well documented in, in accounts of the career of the creative city as a recipe de for development, in the explosive growth of knowledge-driven business sectors that depend on intellectual capital, and also in the conceptual turn uh, towards what George himself has called the expediency of culture. The shift has occurred with a rapidity that has generated, of course, widespread skepticism, not least among cultural workers themselves, who are somewhat unaccustomed to attention, and um, let alone the proverbial limelight. Consequently, the, the policies, the programs, and the statistical outcomes are often regarded in, in those quarters as very uh, uh, slick uh, routines designed to spin value out of thin air or else are aimed perhaps more surreptitiously and insidiously at bringing the last most recalcitrant holdouts into the main currents of marketization where they can swim alongside the less exotic species uh, like managers, insurance agents, and lawyers, all these people who are also a, a included are lumped together in Richard Florida's <coughs> widely cited formulation of the creative class. So, too, there's an element of desperation in this turn towards a creative economy. Managers who are struggling to retain a competitive edge in globalizing markets are very easily sold on any evidence that creative activity in and of itself can somehow generate value for a city, region, or a nation. If nothing else, there's always a proven capacity of creative districts to boost realty prices in select cities building upon well-documented and almost now formulaic cycles of gentrification. At the same time, in an environment where offshore outsourcing has become a way of life, there is still the hope that jobs in a creative economy are the ones that will not be transferred elsewhere and cannot be transferred elsewhere, so they're especially valuable as a result. Among their other virtues, creative occupations don't entail uh, cost-intensive institutional supports, uh, which high-skill manufacturing uh, sectors do, you know, the kind that require very expensive technical infrastructures, as well as uh, customarily lavish tax incentives. All in all, the combination then of low levels of public investment with the potential for high reward outcomes is guaranteed to win the attention of managers who are always on the lookout for some kind of turnaround strategy. Accustomed to seeing corporate investors come and go, they, they tend to seize or want to seize this rare opportunity to capitalize on some kind of place-based formula for redevelopment. And last but not least, uh, there are those who see the creative economy, as, as Kate pointed out this morning, who see the creative economy as a plausible model for job creation that offers work gratification on a genuinely humane basis. 
Not surprisingly, for a, a policy-intensive paradigm, the statistics generated about the creative sector have been legion. By contrast, there's been precious little attention to the quality of work life with which such livelihoods are associated. No doubt, it is ritually assumed that creative jobs, by their very nature, are not deficient in gratification. If anything, their um, packaging of mental challenges and sensuous self-immersion is perceived by administrators to, uh, to somehow offer a surplus of pleasure and satisf satisfaction. Proponents of this line of thinking might well acknowledge that the life of creatives in the past has also been associated with misery, frustration, and deprivation. But the given wisdom is that those pitfalls, these occupational pitfalls, were primarily the result of economic inattention and social marginalization. And so in a milieu where creativity is celebrated on all sides, such drawbacks, such pitfalls will surely wither away or dissolve, vanish. Yet the ethnographic evidence on knowledge in creative industries workplaces tends to show that job gratification for creatives at least still comes at a very heavy sacrificial cost. Longer hours, longer and longer hours in pursuit of the satisfying finish, price discounts in return for aesthetic recognition, self-exploitation in exchange for the gift of autonomy, and dispensability in exchange for flexibility. If policymakers really were interested in this topic, if they were to undertake official surveys of the quality of work life, they would surely find the old formula for creative work very much alive and well in this, in this sort of newly marketized environment. In this respect, arguably the most instrumentally valuable aspect of creative work traditions might turn out to be uh, the carryover of coping uh, strategies, coping strategies that have been developed over centuries to help, um, uh, to help creatives endure a feast and famine economy in return for the promise of success and acclaim. From a managerial point of view, the combination of this coping mentality with, um, with a production code of aesthetic perfectibility is, is a godsend. It's a godsend for managers looking for employees who are capable of self-discipline under the most extreme job pressure. And so it's no surprise that the artist, uh, broadly defined, um, the artist has been seen as the new model worker for high-skill, high-reward employment. It would be a mistake, however, to see the creative sector as simply a marketized uptake of these long-standing traditions of painstaking forbearance and endeavor, abiding endeavor. For the precariousness of work in these fields also reflects, I think, the infiltration of models of non-standard employment from below, from low-wage service sectors. The chronic contingency of employment conditions for all low-skill workers and migrants is more and more normative, where before, it was characteristic of only of a secondary labor market occupied primarily by women, of course, working on a part-time basis or at discounted wages in an era dominated by the family wage of the male breadwinner. Capital owners have, have, um, have realized that they can extract lavish returns from casualization and they increasingly expect the same kinds of returns now in higher skill sectors of the economy. And so as a result, we've seen the steady march of contingency into the lower and middle levels now of the professional and high-wage service industries. This development has prompted some theoretical commentators, especially from uh, the post operaist Italian school, to see the formation of um, a multi-class precariat, somehow linked by shared concerns about insecurity of all aspects of workers' lives. The youthful cast of this multi-class formation is often evoked by the slogan, the precarious generation. And the activist networks generated um, on its behalf are driven by a spontaneous, although far from dogmatic, belief that the precariat is somehow the post-Fordist successor to the proletariat. 
both in theory and practice. Even if this concept is theoretically plausible, does it make sense to imagine cross-class coalitions of the precarious that would be capable of developing a unity of consciousness and action on an international scale? Well, there, there are many critics of this idea, as you can imagine, um, many of whom probably in this room. Critics of this view <laughs> dismiss as naive uh, the assumption that a highly trained aristocracy of labor will find common cause with the less skilled simply on the basis of insecurity, simply on the basis of an experience of radical uncertainty about the future, which is one of the uh, common components of this mentality of precarity. Yet, I would, uh, I would argue, or caution rather, that we, we cannot afford to reject out of hand any evidence of or potential for such forms of cross-class identification. And so, the second part of my presentation is really going to consider the case for and against that, um, the, 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 the theory or the concept of the precariat. In the first part, now, what I want to do is, is try and see how far an insistence on qualitative assessments of work life can take us in changing the conversation about the new precarious work ethic that has emerged and is so much at the heart of uh, the creative industries rubric that we're discussing here. Having said, let me begin by uh, noting also our, our cautioning that the, the concept of quality of work life is, is a little tainted today. Um, largely because of its association with managerial discourse, managerial responses initially in the course of the 1970s to uh, the so-called revolt against work, which uh, originated earlier in that decade. Uh, this is a time when alienation on the job uh, arising from boring, repetitive, or otherwise gratifying tasks produce widespread discontent in white-collar and blue-collar workplaces, resulting in uh, pervasive sabotage, chronic absenteeism, wildcat strikes, all of these things in the early 1970s were interpreted as, uh, interpreted by corporate and government managers as a system-wide protest against the factory-centered conditions of Fordist industrialization. And so, uh, the quality of work life was really the first in a, a long series of management innovations in response to this revolt or against work or refusal of work. Um, quality of work life programs, were, I think they were first introduced by General Motors uh, in factories. Uh, they were supposed to inject some participation, some sense of participation in decision making on the part of the workforce, deliver more personal fulfillment to employees. They were basically uh, one of a whole series of efforts to make work more feel-good and meaningful. But they also marked um, the onset of a long decline in job security. So as the workplace became more inclusive, free, or self-actualizing for employees, it became less just and equal in its provision of guarantees for these same employees. And this was as true for production workers reorganized into teams, exercising a degree of decision-making around their modules, as it was for white-collar employees who were encouraged to be self-directing in their work applications. In either case, the managerial program to sell liberation from drudgery was also accompanied by the introduction of risk, uncertainty, and non-standard work arrangements. So as far as corporate conduct went, it's fair to say that one hand gave while the other hand took. Um, a two-handed tendency which in many ways reached its apotheosis in the new economy profile of the, f of the f free agent. The moment of the free agent was um, when, uh, I'm sure many of you recall this, when even though that wasn't that long ago, uh, when the youthful and youth-minded uh, were urged to break out of the cage of organizational work and go it alone as uh, self-fashioning operatives outside of the HR umbrella of benefits, pensions, and steady merit increases. Um, the discourse of the free agent was temporarily homeless in the wake of the dot-com bust, um, but I think very quickly uh, 
corporate lip service to the superiority of free agency uh, found its new haven in, in, the, in the creative industries itself. Uh, creative industries came along as a very sort of convenient haven for this concept of free agency, which was said were temporarily homeless. Um, and uh, we have to remember this concept of the creative industries is in part a construction of the state's making. And uh, policymakers routinely lump together a motley range of professions under that rubric. So in place of what happened was that in place of exhortations to think outside the box that had been addressed uh, in the late 1990s uh, towards uh, systems analysts, sales agents, projects managers, and other corporate echelons, we now began to hear politicians and policymakers proclaiming that the future of wealth generation might lie in the hands of bona fide creative practitioners who, who, may, who may turn out to be uh, the most uh, exemplary uh, vehicles for free agency, at least for the time being. As before, however, the condition of entry into this new high-stakes lottery which is uh, the, the landscape of work as we know it in neoliberal times. The conditions of entry are you have to leave your safety gear at the door. Only the most spunky, agile, and dauntless will prevail. Uh, this, the narrative itself is little more in many ways than a warmed over version of social Darwinism, but when it's phrased seductively, it's sufficiently appealing to those who are up for the game. Once they're in the game, some of the players certainly do thrive, but most subsist neither as traditional employers or employees in a limbo of uncertainty, juggling their options, massaging their contacts, never knowing where their next project or source of income is coming from. This, um, this cycle of feast and famine is very familiar to anyone whose livelihood falls into the creative economy in the unpredictable tempo uh, a rhythm of life which, uh, which, it, uh, which it delivers is, is certainly far removed from the gospel of steady hard work and thrifty gain that was glorified in the traditional work ethic, the 19th century work ethic. It's more like the survivor challenge of an action video game where skills, sense of timing, and general alertness to the main chance enables the protagonist to fend off threats and claim the prize. And in return for giving up the tedium of stable employment, there's always the thrill of proving yourself by finding out if you have what it takes to survive in the game. Neoliberalism has succeeded wherever its advocates have preached the existential charge of this kind of work ethic and of the virtues of being liberated from the fetters of company rules and managerial surveillance and formal regularity. And I think it's important to note that, why that has been so successful. The low-wage equivalent is a different kind of limbo. For one thing, all of the rungs on the ladder of social mobility, almost all of them, have been knocked out. So there's very little chance of upward of advancement for those in the vast majority of low-end service jobs. While there are no prizes to be won there, the prospect of being trapped in a dead-end job further lubricates the labor markets in those sectors, um, which are already characterized by a high volume of job churning, high rates of turnover, stagnant wage levels, and chronic disloyalty are characteristic features of a formal service economy where intermittent work is more and more the norm. In the informal economy, migrant workers occupy more and more of the vital labor markets. Without their labor, the whole machinery of services, as we know, would grind to a halt. While their rights and work conditions are degraded by off-the-books employment, migrants tend to prize their freedom of movement, which is important to acknowledge. Migrancy is what not only guarantees their remittances, their transnational options and their ability to evade state security, but also their ab ability to evade capitalist discipline. While mass mobility, facilitated by the ready availability of workers, often in straitened circumstances, 
the, flight, the flighty nature of migrant labor is also a source of frustration to the state, the state strictures of population management, and also to capital owners' desire to control labor supply. So too, we might add, corporate flight in pursuit of cheaper labor is never a clean getaway. The bargaining power of labor gets relocated ultimately. It may take a little while, but it shows up. Um, and sooner or later asserts itself. And as for transferring dirty industry to less regulated regions of the world, this is increasingly a corporate liability when toxic substances that taint the brand by showing up back home via the con intercontinental trade in material goods and, and food produce uh, starts to hit the headlines. To insist today on the quality of work life is certainly to call attention to these precarious conditions, both in high-end and low-income occupational sectors. But the ingredients of that demand, if we're to make that kind of demand, I think the ingredients of that demand require careful consideration. It would be a mistake, for example, to simply hark back to the diet of security enjoyed by a significant slice of white-collar and core manufacturing workers in the Fordist era. The male breadwinner of that post-war family wage breathed uh, entirely different air from those employed in the secondary labor markets of the era and more or less did so at the cost of the latter. Workers' gains in these core sectors were often rationalized because the income and status of female pink-collar workers were so degraded. Justice for one was not justice for all in that period. And the trade union leadership of that era, notwithstanding the fact that it, it, it affirmed an alternative understanding of how the economy works, nonetheless, the trade union leadership of that era can rightly be judged on the basis of its complicity with that arrangement, that highly unequal arrangement. In addition, it's important for us to recall that one of the most uh, salient elements of the revolt against work was a protest against the long-term tedium of organizational employment. Again, I'm referring to uh, uh, the early 1970s um, when many workers concluded that the conformist discipline of the kind of stability that was promised and delivered in the Fordist era had not produced meaningful experiential outcomes for them, only classic Marxist alienation on the job. Jobs for life was not a recipe for liberation, nor should it be. So when we speak of the quality of work life today, we cannot speak of security as an aspiration if it simply entails a guaranteed slot in some sclerotic organizational hierarchy where employee participation is clearly tokenistic and where the division of labor functions as a fixed and formal regime of discipline. The academy? Hello. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the appeal of self-employment, which is so pervasive, for example, in the creative sector, is a very powerful draw. And there are reasons for that. It can, and, and, and the appeal of, uh, of self-employment should not be conflated entirely with the neoliberal ethos of the self-absorbed entrepreneur. The market evangelism of neoliberalism, I think, has produced so many converts because, well, why? Because it exploits the credo that individuals have some power over their economic destiny. And as you can imagine, that's a very appealing idea. Yet that belief is not and should not be the exclusive property of market fundamentalists. It can and should be shared by individuals in a vibrant work environment that is also protected from the rough justice of the market. Nor, I think, does the appetite for self-direction necessarily engender a posture of selfish neglect for the welfare of others. Autonomy is not the opposite of solidarity, as is commonly assumed or vulgarly assumed. On the contrary, solidarity, if it is to be authentic, has to be learned cannot be enforced. And this can only occur when we are free enough to choose it as an outcome of efforts and ideas that we share with others. 
It would be misguided then to dismiss entirely the hunger for free agency as a mere product of market ideology. It's not. The flexibility it delivers is a response to an authentic employee demand. Autonomy is and has to be a critical goal, and while its attainment is more approachable for the self-employed, there's no reason why it cannot also be nurtured inside organizations where the work process has been genuinely humanized. In either case, the ability of individuals to take pleasure in freely applying their skills depends on a just social environment which supports and rewards all the players and does not stigmatize those who do not land the most glittering prizes. Contrary to market dogma, basic cultural freedoms can only be secured through regulation. Media deregulation, to take one example, has resulted in a drastic reduction in the range and quality of available public opinion. Conversely, the power of the dominant culture industry corporations depends on the lavish support of many government agencies. Regulation of creative work need not stifle innovation. I think this is another um, myth, another marketeer myth. It just formalizes its conditions of possibility, outlawing the kind of hyper-competitive environment where most of the players turn into losers, along with all of those declared unfit for the contest, whether for reasons of age, attitude, or unreadiness. Consequently, it's harmful to perpetuate the belief that innovation is solely the product of preternaturally endowed individuals. All creative work is the result of shared knowledge and labor. Originality springs forth not from the forehead of geniuses, but from ideas pulled by a community of peers and fellow travelers. Certainly, aesthetic champions are good at what they do, but I don't think we can promote or afford to go along with or promote the assumption that they alone should be beneficiaries of a winner-takes-all culture of creativity which is centered on the acquisition of intellectual property. Among the other resident dogmas of the creative life is the long-standing equation with suffering, as expressed in the stereotype of the struggling artist. But again, there is no natural connection here. Personal, personal sacrifice is not a precondition of creativity. Although widespread acceptance or internalization of this belief is surely one of the reasons why employees in the creative sectors um, tolerate such long hours and discounted compensation and extreme life pressure in return for their shot at producing a gratifying you know, work product. Few things are more damaging to the quality of work life than this belief that the physical and psychic hardship is a living proof of valuable mental innovation. Now, you could say that, well, when compared to the ravages of heavy industrial labor, this may appear to be a minor threat to public health. Um, but when you, when you start uh, quantifying that and analyzing it, um, um, the lionization of that work ethic in, in certain sectors has accelerated the spread to an alarming range of workplaces and occupations of health hazards like burnout and exhaustion and various forms of mental illness and addiction that are associated with um, workplace stress. In place of this debilitating ethos, we need to see creative work, of course, as a basic human right or entitlement of the workforce. After all, the call for meaningful stimulating work was a bedrock demand of the original revolt against work as was flexibility itself. It's important to remember that the flexibility was something that didn't originate with, with managers. It was, it was a demand that came from workers. The current spate of attention to the creative sectors is an opportunity to remember that this, this desire to be creative persists as a goal of all employees. Creative industries policy making was bolstered by uh, sort of Tony Blair faux populist declarations along the lines of uh, everyone is creative. Um, but to fully realize that loose rhetoric about the creativity of ordinary people, how do you bring that into being? What kind of industrial policy do you need to bring that into being? It would certainly require a policy driven not by GDP statistics about the revenue extracted from creative jobs, but rather by qualitative input 
about what makes a job creative. And that kind of research is not something that um, uh, consultants or policymakers are particularly interested in doing, but it's something that academics are very well positioned to do. I think that's a task that we can and should take on. Among migrant workers, where the perils of low-wage contingency are most acute, considerations of the quality of work life have to start with the demand for dignity and respect. As for creativity, it doesn't take much for employers to enhance and reward workers' inherent impulse to extract meaning and pleasure from even the most routine tasks. Um, let me move on to the next, the, the, the final part of this presentation, which is about the precariat. Uh, although they occupy opposite ends of the labor market hierarchy, workers in in low-end retail, low-end services, and the creative class, temping in high-wage knowledge sectors, do share certain elements of precarious or non-standard employment. These include the temporary or intermittent nature of their contracts, the uncertainty of their immediate futures, their isolation from any protective framework of social insurance, demographically youth, women, and immigrants are disproportionately represented in, um, in what commentators have termed the precariat. And while these different segments have existential conditions in common, our question really to, a to ask is, is there any reason to imagine that they interpret or experience those conditions in anything like the same way? And even if they did, or even if they do, is, that co is there enough commonality there to forge any kind of political coalition of interests which would work against the class polarization associated with economic liberalization. Well, over the last decade or so, precarity has emerged as a mobilizing concept for sectors of the European left and for a while became a stock slogan among anti-globalization activists, uh, theorists of the uh, post-opera school who see the cognitive workforce of immaterial labor as harboring a potential source of power were often invoked to lend heft to a political consciousness that was um, promoted by organized anti-precarity youth groups. Public manifestations of this precarious generation centered and still do to some extent around the Euro May Day events which began to attract tens of thousands of participants in dozens of cities from about 2002 onwards. Organized groups like the chain workers in Italy or Les Intermittents in France captured headlines with their inventive actions. In, indeed, in, in France, government plans to introduce labor policies that discriminated against youth generated massive student resistances in occupations of universities in recent years. Formative events, uh, formative efforts have been made to link student movements, service worker struggles, immigrant rights, and proto-militancy in the new media sectors. And the goal here has clearly been to build some kind of cross-class alliance drawn from sectors of the service class, the creative class, and the knowledge class, uh, which ultimately students and trade unions would come to support. On the face of it, an alliance of cleaners, web designers, and adjunct teachers, just to cite three representative occupations from these sectors, is an unlikely prospect. It's easier to imagine on paper as a theoretically plausible construct than as some kind of flesh and blood coalition in broad agreement on strategies and goals. No doubt some members of this putative coalition would like nothing more than to have full-time work with benefits thrown in. Others surely do prefer the intermittent life. They take part-time employment so they can fund other interests like acting, writing, travel, or recreation. Even among low-wage service workers, there are reasons to favor flexibility. In this respect, precarity is something that's very unevenly experienced to say the least, across this spectrum of workers. Since contingent work arrangements are imposed on some and are self-chosen or self-elected by others, in and of itself, and precarity cannot really be a common target, but rather, and this is 
one of the better spins to put on it, precarity is a kind of zone of contestation between competing versions of flexibility in labor markets. Ideally, workers should be free to choose their own level of flexibility in a socially regulated environment where the consequences of such choices are protected against unwanted risk and degradation. So too, there appears to be a gulf between the highly individualizing ethos of uh, creative and knowledge workers on the one hand and the tolerance, even enthusiasm, for traditional collective action on the part of service workers. Immigrant organizing and campaigns like Justice for Janitors, for example, has played a large and ongoing role in renovating the trade union movement, especially in cities like Los Angeles, and may yet transform the labor movement as a whole. On May Day 2006, you will remember the mass mobilizations against repressive anti-immigrant legislation in a host of U.S. cities was a tribute to the power of collective protest and organization. And these developments and others have proven that organizing the unorganizable was not only feasible, but that the results far exceeded expectations and have given fresh hopes to uh, the labor movement in that regard. By that same token, creative and cognitive workers are often assumed to be incapable of organizing, largely on account of their, their self-directed uh, mentality, their individualism. Yet, wherever they have turned to union-based action, they have been surprised to find how quickly a common sense of purpose emerges. And I'm sure you have, many of you have examples of this. Recent North American examples include, say, the IT workers in the WASHTAC union which is an affiliation of the CWA, who become a lobbying force in a range of industrial regulation, uh, legislation. Also, um, the adjuncts and graduate teachers who have jump-started the academic labor movement by organizing at the very margins of the profession. And even the most recent Hollywood writer's strike, whose internal resolve was buoyed by prominent support from other industry professionals, Cross-class coalitions are not very easy to envisage, let alone build. But I think we should be attentive to any evidence of the fellow feeling that is their precondition. In my own research, for example, in IT and other uh, technology-driven firms, I find it very common for employees to refer to their workplaces as high-tech sweatshops, <coughs> especially when they're pressured by long hours, deadlines, speed-ups, and crunch time stress on the job. Now, no doubt these are throwaway comments and are often simply expressions of the most cynical side of office humor, but they also contain real elements of self-recognition and identification with the plight of those toiling in workplaces customarily associated with the term sweatshop. It's useful perhaps to remember, and there are many historical examples of this, but I'll just mention one. Wage slavery once resonated as a slogan in, uh, in this country in the 1840s. It was a slogan um, for skilled northern artisans who were opposed to factory de-skilling and, and also employee efforts to make them compete with southern chattel labor. Um, the slogan um, also played a role in abolitionist sentiment and action even though it was increasingly displaced by the more racist shibboleth of white slavery. Um, however complicated, however as a form of identification, however fraught as a catchword for the free labor movement of the time, it established a kind of continuity between the plantation and the factory, um, which had a moral power that did help to establish cross-class and transracial solidarity. And I would argue that today, the equivalent today, actually, that moral power today has been claimed um, uh, by the slogan, the global sweatshop, uh, fully teasing out the, the, um, uh, uh, the connotations of that slogan. The anti-sweatshop movement has built a very agile international coalition to confront the power of large corporations and has succeeded as much as anyone in part in pushing labor rights onto the table of reluctant policymakers who shape global trade agreements. The student wing of that movement succeeded in orienting undergraduate consciousness towards labor issues, 
arguably for the first time since the 1930s. And some of that impetus is carried over, as I'm sure many of you know in campuses of your own, into cross-class campaigns for a living wage for service workers on campus and in campus towns. Well, the anti-sweatshop movement helped revive public sympathy for the predicament of labor or, or workers in labor-intensive jobs. It also made available a moral language and a moral posture for those in value-added trades who are more and more inclined to see their occupational sectors following a similar path offshore and down market. Now that offshore outsourcing has climbed into white-collar sectors and is taking its toll on the professions, the plight of garment workers onshore and offshore can no longer be viewed as a remote example of job degradation, unlikely to affect the highly skilled. And creatives, I think, creative workers are only the latest of a long line of employees who who are told that come what may, there will always be a domestic onshore need for their occupational talent, that their talents cannot be replicated elsewhere, and that their, their, their jobs will be secure and cannot be outsourced. Yet the industrialization of creativity has been proceeding for some time now as managers in the knowledge industries uh, constantly on the lookout for project templates that will impose uh, kind of reliable industrial rhythm or tempo on the delivery of intangibles like ideas, concepts, models, formulae, and renderings. Though they tend to share the mentality of elites, independently minded brain workers are often the easiest to alienate, even radicalize when their thought processes are uh, subject to routinization. And I guess one of the more conspicuous examples is, is the academic. No, once occupational security, uh, higher education is now in this country and others awash with contingency. Um, there has been no other professional sector whose core has been degraded so rapidly and with such uh, uh, consistency over the last 10 or 15 years or so. For the largely youthful ranks of adjuncts now, the experience of deprofessionalization has triggered an embryonic labor movement that may yet transform the workplace if it can successfully draw in larger numbers of the securely tenured. Now, uh, let me just conclude um, by citing um, the example of the Popular Front, because at least for, uh, for the North American left, the Popular Front remains a shining historical example of cross-class alliances. The ecumenical spirit of the CIO in that era, um, as many of you know, challenged the craft exclusiveness of the AFL trade unions by advocating uh, organizing the unskilled alongside the skilled. And in that era, it was that, in that era that creative sector unions from the fields of entertainment, journalism, and the arts made common cause with proletarian interests and reached out to the unemployed, displaced, and destitute. The Popular Front itself was, uh, technically speaking, an anti-fascist formation promoted by the Comintern and its fellow travelers. But it would not have been popular if the foundation for those cross-class relationships had not been so soundly laid in, um, in, the, in the, the first years of the Great Depression for the, the Popular Front was actually declared as a policy in 1936. That the liberal version, at least, often termed the New Deal Coalition, the liberal version of the Popular Front endured for several decades as a testament to the strength of these cross-class alliances. We know the backdrop to the Popular Front was, of course, the Great Depression. And the widespread propagation of precarity in that era was the result of a collapse of capitalist control. By contrast, today's precarity is in large part an exercise of capitalist control. This is a big distinction. It's not about the collapse of capitalist control, it's the exercise of capitalist control to disorganize, um, uh, disorganize the ranks of workers in all sectors. Post-industrial capital thrives on actively disorganizing employment and socioeconomic life in general so that it can profit from vulnerability and instability and desperation. 
Now, there are some thinkers, uh, autonomists, or in, in the autonomous tradition, who see this disorganization as an advantage. Why? Because it harbors the potential for pushing creative labor outside of the orbit of disciplining institutions like the state or the large corporations or the trade unions. <coughs> One of the slogans that captures this tendency is the self-organizing precariat. Speaks not only to the oppositional side of the free agency mentality, which was lionized by liberation capitalists, but also to long-standing traditions of grassroots democracy in workers' movements. In some respects, you could say that this autonomous tendency is a clear rejection of the path taken by new left advocates who, from the early 1970s on, pursued the long march through the institutions, you know, with the goal of reforming the culture of power from the inside. Um, and, and we know we, we inherited much of the, the academic left culture um, from that instinct in that regard. And in the sphere of ideology, of course, you can cite the example of the myriad of alternative sites of informational activity uh, that populate the busy landscape of attention. Um, many of them, you know, sort of loosely defined under the rubric of social networking. And a large percentage of work itself has increasingly been distributed from, in, uh, has increasingly been transferred from institutional sites of production into the realm of consumption and social networking, where we're talking about the subsumption of life by work and the transfer of work to all sectors of waking life, what the autonomous called the social factory. The outside is no longer the extraneous, in other words, marginal, peripheral to the truly decisive proceedings. Increasingly, it is where the action is located and where in many ways, our attention to building resistance and solidarity might be best directed. And I think um, the recent focusing of interest in the creative sector, the creative economy, the creative industries, um, interest from the left, um, the recent focusing of interest in a fringe sector, what seems to be a fringe sector like creative labor, uh, really ought to be seen as part of that story, uh, the relocation of attention. And, and they're no longer clean demarcation between outside and inside uh, institutional sites. I think I should end there. Thank you.